Now, our first hymn of the morning, What a Wonderful World, is found on page four. And somebody. Can we sing the first verse again? It's kind of yeah. lovely. A wonderful world, a very a wonderful world. Now I find the peace and the joy with what a wonderful world. And so it is. Tell me you feel it. 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 <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Thank you so much. And you hear the harmony? All the tenors and the altos and the not so like myself, but all the harmonies. Bring it together and it sounds beautiful. <laughs> we'll have now. Today we'll have. Well, instead they say of mothers who used to come up and speak on the joys of motherhood, we're flipping it this year and we're having children come up and give one or any one minute tributes to mothers. Yes, one minute, 60 seconds, one minute tributes to mothers. And the floor is now open for tributes to mothers. Come on up, you all have nice things you want to say to your mother. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I can't look at Zara, sorry. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Being the dead stamp of an arraign or a moat, it proves quite difficult trying to hide while wandering the streets of Kingston. I cannot begin to tell you the many times people have approached me and said, Michelle Arraign is the sweetest and kindest person ever. How could I not agree? My mom is thoughtful. No matter where my siblings and I were in the world, we would get unexpected greeting cards in the mail, all perfectly timed for homesickness, heartbreak, and sometimes just to remind us that we are loved, and maybe a little cash. <laughs> she is giving. She raised the three of us, but also opened her home without hesitation to my nephew Bryce, her friend's children, as well as exchange students, all of whom consider her a mom. She is patient. Lord knows we were never perfect, at times possibly breaking our heart just a little. No matter the circumstance, she was always there. She is calm, never one to raise her voice. She steadied any storm that came our way. So what have I learned from my wonderful mother? I think it's pretty clear. There is one thing, however, that sums up everything she does, and that is lead with love in all ways and always. 
You are our rock star, mommy. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, everyone. You know that in the mornings when we wake up and mm -hmm. come here, okay. In the mornings when we wake up and it's we usually are a little groggy, and I will sort of and I go into the bathroom and I hit the mirror and I go <laughs> because I'm looking at my mother. My mother, her birthday was yesterday and she would have been 89. And so I really like to honor her for the nurturing, for the values that she brought me, for teaching me to bake the best put Christmas pudding in the world, for giving me that creative spirit that enables me to cook and bake and sew and, and do all those wonderful things. And also for the, for, the, for, 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 for the most important thing, she taught me how to be a mother and I'm a mother to a special, not a child anymore, but it has really strengthened me, and I know I've drawn that strength from her. So I really honor her. I value her. I celebrate her. I look at her every morning, and I just know that wherever she is, she's my angel watching me. Love you, Mommy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so this is quite impromptu of me. I just decided just a while ago to come up, right? So first off, on Friday, I celebrated my birthday, right? And uh, as customary, most times, me and mommy would sit down and discuss how I came into this world. <laughs> and I'm going to spare you guys the details, right? Um, but long and short of it, what I and she tells me this every year, right? But um, what I get from it, right, more importantly than the details is really this, the struggle that she had to go through to bring me into this world, first off, and the sacrifices that she has made over the years to ensure that this man is standing in front of you speaking the way he speaks, right? Um, and every day, me and mommy go about the place and thing. She always, uh, you know, she will meet new people and we make new friends and they always tell me one thing, Peter, see that woman here, yeah? take care of her, right? She, more with a love for her mother like for she. And uh, I always respond with, I know, <laughs> you know? Always, and I feel proud, very proud to be called the son of Miss Paulette Josephs right here, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. So. Yeah, everything that I, not just me, but me, my sister, and my brother, everything that we are today started with this woman right here. And uh, for that, I don't think I can even fathom how much I can love her. I'm going to spend the rest of my life I love her, simply put. And even that is not enough. Right? Love you, mommy. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Hi, good morning, one and all. My mother, my mom is home now. She ain't feeling so great today. But one of the things, I was just sitting here thinking and I'm thought about my mother. My mother taught me compassion. She taught me how to value other people. You know, always caring, always giving away all that she has uh, for the other persons. I also thought about my daughter, my wonderful grandson, who is a mother. And I realized how much my daughter has gotten from the person who I am, the person I've evolved to be. And I give God thanks that my mother put me on the journey, put me on the pathway, and I'm passing that on to my mother. So I want to say happy Mother's Day to all our wonderful mothers inside here. Hi. 
Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> well, my, my mother was supposed to be here already, and as usual, as usual, we are very late people. <laughs> this, this morning, Rev asked me if I slept halfway here and my house that I got here this early. <laughs> so, yes. So, but even though she's not here, I grew up mostly with my grandma. I grew up mostly with my grandma. Yes, and so the, I believe the attributes that I have are from my grandmother, mostly. And so today I am honoring both of them. But as well, there's a special lady here, Miss Leslie. I'm not sure if she's here yet. But Miss Leslie is my <laughs> temple mother. She was the one who invited me here, and I have to include her. Because I believe that right here, right now, this is one of the biggest things I've ever done. This is a part of the biggest thing I've ever been a part of. Wow. And I really, really thank you all for being family to me. And you all lead by your examples. But I am honoring my birth mother and my grandma for pouring into me. And yes, I now have a 21-year-old son. Yes, I'm old enough. <laughs> and yes, I now pass on all the things that they say to me easily, just come effortlessly. But as well, I'm learning new things and how to just let go and let him find his own path as well. So thank you, and it's an honor to be standing here sharing. Raja, come here. Morning, Temple. I just have a little passage to read to you. It's called The Children's Angel. It begins with, an ancient legend tells of an unborn child who one day said unto God, I am told that you are sending me down to earth tomorrow, but how will I live there? I am, I am so small and weak. <clears throat> Sorry. God answered, among the many angels, I have chosen one to care for you. Please tell me then, here in heaven, heaven, all I do for my happiness is sing and smile, and I can do all these things as well? You have to forgive my voice. I am kind of emotional when I read this. <laughs> God answered, among the many angels, I have chosen one to care for you. Please tell me then, the child said, please tell me then, here in heaven, all I do for my happiness is sing and smile. Can I do these things as well? The Lord said, I will send an angel who will sing and smile for you every day, and you will feel happy, and the songs and smiles will continue. The, the child said, how will I understand when someone to me, if I do not know the strange language mankind speaks, an angel will speak to you and the sweetness and most tender words that humans can understand. The angel will teach you. The child said, what will I do when I wish to speak to you? An angel will join your little hands and will teach you a prayer. The child said, I have heard that on earth there are many bad men. Who will protect me? The Lord said, an angel will protect you, and even at the expense of its own, its own life. The child said, and who is this angel, Lord? And the Lord said, said the, the angel's name is Mother. I am, every time I read this, I get so caught up because my mother, she is the epitome of this poem. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Short and sweet. I have many mothers to give thanks for this morning. My mom who is here, 
my great grandmother who passed away when I was two. I never really knew her, but I heard she whispered something special in my ear. My mother who also passed here, my temple mother, Reverend Elmo. Another mother who I treasure very dearly, who also passed, Sharon. And several other temple mothers in here. And all have one common thread. They taught me what Ernest Holmes said, to learn how to think is to learn how to live. And that is how I live. And I give thanks for all of them in my life, those who are here, those who have gone, those who are with me now. And I'm thankful. Happy Mother's Day. To close off our Mother's Day tributes, Rhonda Lumsden Lou and friends will give a version of Avea Maria. Welcome. I think for this song is just the and friends. is one of the early trailblazers in, of truth in Jamaica. She belonged to the first group of religious science practitioners who studied with our founder, Reverend Helma Lumsden, 
and has been a lifelong practitioner for the science of mind. Reverend John Scott tells how we first heard her speak at a midweek service in early 80s and how in awe he was of her ability to explain quite complex truth principles in simple and understandable yet eloquent language. He credits her with being one of the people who inspired his journey to ministry. A graduate of the Norman Manley Law School, she is by profession an attorney at law, having been called to the bar in 2000. She is the proud mother of former British football star, John Barnes, and has chosen as her topic today, things I wish I had known before coming a, becoming a mother. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming this morning's speaker, Mrs. Jean Barnes. If that were all I was going to share with you, it wouldn't be worth sharing because I knew absolutely nothing about being a mother before I became a mother. Thank you so much. And thank you, Reverend John, for affording me this opportunity to share some thoughts which I have. Um, as Michelle said, it was in the 80s, that was the very last time I spoke like this. All my talking these days is trying to defend my clients. So there are lots of excuses and lots of pleas for mitigation of sentence and stuff like that. So this, this morning has filled me with quite a bit of trepidation because I haven't had the opportunity to share these thoughts that I have had with you all. And so once again, I thank you. I heard about a blessing for children and grandchildren. Of course, very boastfully, I have to tell you, I have two great grandchildren. Yes. So I am trying to look a little modest about it, but <laughs> it don't work. This is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a wonderful day. Wonderful. Um, it's Mother's Day, and normally, mothers would be sitting back and basking in all the encomiums that we'd be getting and just lapping it up. I would be wondering with me they're really talking about. But it's also a child's month. So what I hope to do is to share some ideas about mothering, which I hope you can find useful. But it's just my ideas. And I think that after having these children, I have three and seven grands and these two greats that maybe some of what I say you can use, perhaps. Before I became a mother, I was going to have six children. Three boys and three girls, a boy first, a girl next, a boy and so on. The girl was going to be last. That was my plan. I got married in 1960. I knew nothing about science of mind. And I also knew that I wanted, to, I wanted these children to feel nurtured and so they would nestle on my chest. So I was going to have an ample chest so that I could be a proper mother. Honestly, I was going to be a proper mother. Well, when I got married, I was weighing 111 pounds and my chest was bony. So they never nestled anywhere. As a matter of fact, if I tried to hug them, would kind of cut the bones and they're still here. And as I said, I had two girls and then a boy. And then no more after that. So here we are. All my lessons, everything that I had thought that I would put into practice, that would happen to me when I became a mother. And I need to tell you that I got married in July in England. 
1960. And from the day I got married, I wanted to be pregnant immediately. <laughs> and I shared this with my colleagues at work at the West Indies High Commission. And every day I said, Jean, you're pregnant yet? I said, no. I felt I was going to be sterile for the rest of my life. <laughs> anyway, my eldest child was born 10 months. <laughs> 10 months after I got married. So that was it. May, 10 months. So I was born the following May. So then I have these children. But then when they were very small, I decided I wanted a career. And I, first of all, saw an advertisement to sell books in Mr. Sangster's bookstore. And I thought, oh, I love books, so I'll just apply for that job and get it. And then I'll be just discussing literature every day with intellectuals who would come in and we would talk about the latest intellectual offerings. Well, my job was to dust out the store window every morning. And Mrs. Sangster was very vigilant about the cash register. And it was an extremely unsatisfactory type of job. When my friends would be driving down East Street, I would be hiding because there was I with the, with the duster, dusting down the windows. So that didn't suit me. Then I got a job at JBC, and that was Oh, that was my whole life. So my poor children, I don't think they had benefit of a mother because I put my whole life into broadcasting. Fortunately, they grew up in a park camp where my husband was an officer. And they were safe and they were happy. I don't think they wanted to see too much of me anyhow. They were having a wonderful time. They were secure. They were up and down. And so for about 25 years, they lived a lovely, free, and happy life in a park camp. We didn't lock up the house. We'd leave it open till one morning we woke up and saw right beside our bed a scissors about this long and some a mad a, a soldier who had been mad and who thought my husband was going to lead him to Africa had come into the house through the open door. So we started to lock the door from then. <laughs> and that went on until 1976 when we went to England. Still don't know anything about mothering, you know, because I'm not paying attention to these children much, you know. I am really pursuing my own career. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm loving it. And the children seem to be OK. Fortunately, their father was there. He worked in camp. So they got all the mothering and fathering from him, I have to tell you. And then in England, we were there. And it was a lovely experience. We all enjoyed it very much. One thing I will say that I taught my children. And I didn't teach them, because that's how I was. I loved being in England. I was happy to have gone there. And even though my husband felt some trepidation, I was so happy to be there that the children were happy too. So that we're all extremely happy. And my son, landing at Heathrow this Sunday morning, he said he saw fields, about eight football fields. He was 11. He saw eight football fields and the boys in uniform and a referee with a whistle. And I mean, such discipline. He said, I have come home because this is where he is he's going to be. This is where he's going to be, and this is what he's going to do. He's going to be a footballer. So there, it, none of that was any credit to me. I don't think I taught them anything. We just, we just had a good time. It wasn't until 1981, when we came home, that I started to do the Science of Mind course with Reverend Elmer, and then began to think, to think along lines of truth. Because I loved the saying, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I loved that. And so that began my journey, by which time, of course, the children were not in my care and control any longer. They had gone, Johnny stayed in England, and my two daughters, one was at law school, one went about her business in Montego Bay. And by 86, it was an empty nest. And so I, but I, learned to deal with them in a truthful way. It was not too late, even though they were no longer in my care and control. So these thoughts I'm going to share with you are thoughts that I, that I have learned and I've come to believe to be the truth. First of all, the word is love. Now this love, we say God is love. 
that is, it, that is the, the, the biggest thing about God, is that God is love. And because God is love, because we are loved unconditionally, we are given freedom. We are free. And that is one of the first lessons that I taught, that I thought to myself, our children must be free. They must be loved unconditionally. They cannot be loved in the expectation of getting something in return. Gratitude, appreciation, remembrance, nothing. They love whatever we get. It, we are not looking for anything. We love our children the way God loves us, unconditionally. The other thing is that love, it's a feeling. It's true, but it's, it's a doing word. Love does. Love doesn't talk about it. Love doesn't feel about it. Love does. And that's how we know about the existence of God because of all the things that are done by this infinite intelligence, this creative power that put us here, that has made this world such a wonderful and beautiful place, given us freedom to choose, freedom to be, freedom to experience, all the freedom in the world. Freedom to be what you call bad. Freedom to make war. Freedom to do all the things that we do. Freedom of choice. And that is what we as parents have to pass on to our children. They have to be free. There is, um, there is something called a mother complex. And, it, and this is from a man called Dr. Quimby, Dr. Quimby who wrote, who started the whole business of metaphysical science and of linking physical illnesses, conditions to mental equivalences. And Ernest Holmes learned a lot from Dr. Quimby, as did the lady who founded Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, and so on. But it is, so, it is such a wonderful thing. He has something here called mother complex, which he puts in brackets and calls smother love. <laughs> smother love. And the correspondence, the mental correspondence to smother love is possessiveness. And we have to remember that our children come from our bodies, but not from our minds. Our children are gifts of God. They come through our bodies, but they do not belong to us. We cannot possess them. We cannot use them to express all those unfulfilled desires we had as children. We didn't have this, and we didn't have that, so they're going to have this, and they're going to have that, and we're going to possess them thereby. Selfishness, and this one, Dominance. Me are the mother. So I dominate this place. I dominate. No. And Dr. Quimby provides the solutions because this is what we are here for. Solutions to all of these things which we, which we have. Now, it's, it's, many of us would not admit that we are possessive. We are selfish or we, are, we try to dominate. We wouldn't admit it. We don't look at ourselves. It's hard. To begin with, I have asked friends of mine if they know what they look like, and they said no. My husband said he never knew what he looked like. Thank God he didn't know how handsome he was. <laughs> but friends tell me that they don't know what they look like. You have to know what you look like. Look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself so you know what you look like. Because when you come for your treatments, when you come to do your spiritual mind healing treatments, you have to have an image of yourself. Being happy, being prosperous, being well, throwing away the walking stick, whatever it is, you have to know what you look like. But that is one part of it. But that is not as important as knowing the things that are to your disadvantage, these character traits that we have that are to our disadvantage. Very strong-willed. I've heard about strong-willed women. Boy, they use that will, and I'm telling you, they're determined. And by hook or by crook, they're going to get this thing. And I tell you, that is not the use of the will. 
The use of the will is not to be determined to get by hook or crook what you think you want. The will is to keep in place the discipline to do our spiritual mind healing treatment every day. The will is to will us, to, when the, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, the will is to keep us on the path. Not to have control over anybody, to keep us, to keep us doing our treatments. We don't feel to do this, we don't feel to do that. Strengthen my will and infinite intelligence. Strengthen my will to do what my duty to myself, my community, to the world, to do that duty. That's what that will is for. So we don't like to admit it, but we have to really face ourselves. And we don't have to feel guilty because the law, God does not, there's no creative intelligence, doesn't know our history, doesn't know anything about us except that it made us perfect. That creation story, where it's the day, the literal story, the day that when it was all done, and according to the Old Testament, God looked at his creation and said, it is good and very good. Still going on. Creation never stopped. Every day, creative intelligence is looking on and saying, it is good and very good. And we are meant to do that. We have the power to co-create with God and to look at what we are doing and saying, it is good and very good. So we have to look at ourselves to change those things that need changing. We have to look at ourselves. Say, you are too, you, you're always, you're too selfish. Why you want to tell this child the way to be? Let the child be free to be itself. Why you criticize the child? You can't, you, this is wrong with you, that is wrong. Why you can't be like your sister? Why you can't be like the neighbor? I know parents who do this all the time, comparing their children with others. You have to, uh, you have to glory in the, your children's personalities because they come into the world with personalities. They're not a blank slate on which you're going to write your, what you would like for them. They come into the world with personality. And the nurturing that they get helps to develop it and helps to realize their full potential. So you can't look at your children and begin to put them down, to shame them, to criticize them. You have to correct them. You are their teacher at home. The teacher at school teaches them the lessons. You at home train them by example. Because I can tell you something. You could think that they're obeying you because you're, they're doing as you say. They're putting it in their pipe and smoking it. You're saying one thing, but you're doing a next. And they know it. Well, they know it. We have to be authentic. We have to be integrated. We have to be genuine. When we, uh, we have to set by example. Now, isn't it wonderful? Because what does it mean? That we, in order to be an example, have to become perfect. We have to work on ourselves in order to be an example to our children. And this is why we are here. We come to classes because Jesus, beautiful, our teacher, our way sure, we call him in the science of mind, told us, be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We are to spend our time becoming perfect so that we can be perfect examples for our children. We can't be hypocritical. We can't be like the whited sepulchers and the Pharisees who are always praying and, and, and presenting one front to the world, but in the heart of hearts, and something else is going on. We have to be authentic. Now, there's no need to beat ourselves over the head because we made these, we think we made these mistakes. We did the best we could, always. Not unless you said, I could have done this and I could have done that. And I, I know that's wrong, but I'm going to do that. We very rarely act like that. Whatever we act, we are convinced that's the best we could do under the circumstances. And it is true. Therefore, forgive yourself immediately. Blanket forgiveness. Anything, any mistake you think you made, anything you think you did wrong, forgive yourself right away and press right on to do better, to learn. That's why we are here in the Temple of Light, to learn in the science of mind. And we learn, we learn that we are already perfect and what we are doing is becoming. We are in the process of becoming. And it's a wonderful adventure. It's a wonderful adventure because we see results. We see when we let go of criticizing our children, 
We see when we let go of comparing them. We see when we let go of loving them conditionally, when we love them unconditionally. We'll see results in them. <coughs> so this is what we are called upon to do. Now, we have to affirm what is it that we want. We want our children to be successful. It is legitimate. We want them to achieve. We want the best for them. The thing that we should want first and foremost for our children is for them to be happy. For them to be happy. Because that's what we're all seeking. That's what we want. And we think if our children are successful and achieve this and achieve that and are recognized by the world, we'll be happy too. Not so. We'll be happy when we are happy within ourselves, regardless of what our children turn out to be. And from that happy standpoint, and we, 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 we spend time seeking this happiness through knowing the truth, through being free in the truth, the truths of life that set free that Ernest Holmes tells us about. So we have to, when we say the Our Father, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Why do you think that is there? But to make heaven right here. Thy kingdom come on earth. And no government is going